Hi, okay, I hope um, people can see me. I think the way I was doing it before wasn't quite right. Um, this is actually the first time that I've done a Facebook live thing, so I hope it works. Um, and for those of you who tried to get on a little bit while ago, I'm sorry that it didn't work, but it does seem to be working now. Um, so I, uh, great. So some people are joining again. I'm so sorry. I couldn't quite figure this out a few minutes ago, but I do see that a number of people are joining now. So I'm really happy to hear it's actually working now. Sorry for the delay. Um, okay. So <clears throat> a good number of people are joining. So I'll just continue to let people log on before I get started. Um, what I hope to do is shed some light on these executive orders and what they're really doing. I know that there's a lot of emotion right now around the executive orders. There's a lot of outrage. All of that is appropriate and I actually think may be um, understated given what's really in the orders. So we'll talk a little bit more about that specifically. Um, and uh, there are three executive orders in total, and each one is very detailed, very specific. It contains some things in it that um, the president can do on his own, and then there are other things that require congressional action. And I think sometimes in the public debate, those two things are being conflated, and so it's really hard for people to understand uh, what's really going to happen versus what is just being threatened to happen. But what's absolutely accurate is that we are no longer in the um, age of rhetoric, and we are now in the age of action, just uh, at an astronomical pace just in the last week alone. And so these things are very real. And I want to try to demystify um, what's real and like was implemented yesterday and, and a few days ago, and then also what is still to come because there's some differences there. Um, before I start talking about the details of the executive orders, I first just want to give a huge shout out um, to the attorneys on the front lines. Um, there have been a lot of wonderful people who are mobilizing in the streets and calling their Congress people, calling the White House. All that action is good. People are donating to nonprofits. Um, all that action is good. Please don't underestimate your efforts. Everything matters. It all matters right now. Um, nothing matters a little. It, every little thing matters a lot, actually. Um, but particularly the lawyers, many of whom I know personally, have stayed up all night um, writing writs of habeas corpus for people they have not met yet, ready to plug in their names. Um, a huge shout out to Archie Piotti, Tahereh's Director of Policy and Programs, who's at Dulles International Airport right now, helping people. Um, and so, you know, there's there, there are a lot of skills that it takes to change the world, um, but I do want to give a shout out to the lawyers in particular. Um, you know, revolutions in the past have often been fought with violence, and um, there are many revolutions who are fought in the law, and that's happening right now. So, okay, let's get started. I think um, now we have a critical mass of people. Um, so I'm going to go through the executive orders and explain what they mean, and then at the end, I'm going to explain what you can do about it. There are a lot of things that people can do, and I want to give you some concrete avenues um, for how to express your thoughts right now. Um, so, you know, I, I think at a meta level, there are three different executive orders, and I will talk about all three, um, but at a meta level, I think all three, all together, all at once, do some really bad meta things in addition to the detail behind them. Um, the first and most important thing that they do that's the most damaging is they fail to recognize the oneness of humanity. And I know that sounds really lofty, but what I mean by that is that all three of these executive orders believe that by harming 
some group, some subset of a group, we will all benefit when we know history has proven and every single moral, spiritual, and value code makes it absolutely clear that we only benefit when all of us benefit and that we are, in fact, one human family. And that's, to me, what's really most disturbing about these orders, aside from the legal details of them. Um, they also really weaken us by inhibiting the most intelligent, the most innovative, um, in the world from contributing to our country. Um, many of you might have seen that um, most major corporations just in the last 24 hours have all come out um, in opposition and with outrage around these executive orders. Google, Facebook, um, Microsoft, Apple, all these companies are recognizing that in fact, we will be damaged purely crassly, purely economically, purely financially, let alone kind of the spiritual implications of all of this, um, because we really need to have the best and the brightest. Um, in the United States, we need business people to be able to travel easily in, throughout the world. And these bills make it difficult. They are far, far more reaching than just its effects on refugees. Um, and so it's really going to hurt us. Um, some people have asked me that Wall Street seems pretty happy with these policies, and they've noticed the, the um, Dow Industrial go up. I think something that's important to explain <clears throat> is that the stock market is not an indication of societal well-being. It's an indication of the prediction of wealthy people about getting more wealthy. And so <laughs> I want people to understand that, that the stock market, 76% um, of all stocks are held by the top 10% most wealthy people. So to the degree to which the stock market is reacting at all, it's really reacting based on the opinion of the top wealthiest 10% in the United States. And in fact, 50% of the stock market is controlled by the top 1% wealthiest in the United States. So when people kind of say, well, the economy seems to be reacting well, I think it's really important to know who is really reacting. It's rich people who think they're going to get more rich um, who are reacting in the stock market. Um, so, you know, in addition to it weakening us economically as a country with um, the inability of people to immigrate, in addition to it harming our understanding of the oneness of humanity, um, finally, these orders just flat out place us in great, great danger. Um, and it's it's mind blowing to me, really, um, because we have targeted the wrong countries, completely targeted the wrong countries. So one of the executive orders um, bans refugees from seven countries, and um, in those those seven countries happen to be where the victims of terrorists live not where the terrorists live. So very specifically, um, September 11th was committed by individuals from Egypt, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Not one of those countries have been banned, not one. So they're able to still enter the country, but this ban applies to many other Muslim majority countries that are arguably the victims of terrorists, not the source countries of terrorists. Um, so it really makes us more vulnerable. There was a Cato Institute study recently issued, and, and for those of you who may know, Cato Institute is a uh, conservative think tank. And it issued a study that said your chances of being killed by a refugee are one in 3.6 billion. Like you have a better chance of being hit by lightning. And that's under our current very stringent, rigorous security mechanisms in place. So um, we are not, in fact, protecting our country for terrorism by these laws and factually. And I think it's really important for people to understand that. What we are doing, though, is pissing off the world, and that's going to make us much more vulnerable. Okay, so going into the executive orders very specifically. Okay, so I want to talk about, let's see, there are, uh, okay, there were two passed on January um, 25th, um, and then there was one passed on January 29th. I'm going to focus, or sorry, the 28th. I'm going to focus on the one on the 28th first because that's the one getting the most press. But then I want to move on from that because I actually think the more concerning executive orders were passed on January 25th. And I want to actually spend most time talking about those. Um, 
the one that was passed that's getting the most press that deals with refugees was on January 28th. So the one passed on January 28th bars all people from Iraq, Syria, Iran, Lib Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen from entering the United States for the next 90 days. That's everyone for any reason who's not a United States citizen from those countries. And we've just learned that it includes people who are dual citizens. Um, the government issued a statement just this morning backing down on one aspect of that. They said, okay, if you are, have lawful permanent residence, meaning if you have a green card from one of those countries, you can re-enter the United States, um, which, thank God, because those are people whose families are living here, who are married to U.S. citizens, who have children who are U.S. citizens, but that's the only um, concession so far on, on that provision. Um, the Those seven countries, <clears throat> which I've already discussed, you know, neither had any role in September 11th and the ones that did are not being banned. Um, the executive order asks for an additional list from the Department of Homeland Security for additional countries to be included in the ban within 60 days. And, um, and so these may not be the only countries. The executive order also bans um, those entering from Syria indefinitely. So those other countries was, were 90 days, but in the order, it pre seemed to presume that there would be a renewal of that, that uh, time frame, but it's the initial time frame. Those from Syria are now indefinitely banned. Um, just so that you have an idea of scale here, the United States, um, Obama talked about maybe accepting 10,000 refugees from Syria. Um, he only, in fact, accepted uh, about a little over 3,000 refugees from, a, from Syria that are still many of which are processed that will not even come now. Um, by stark contrast, at our southern border, just over the last two years alone, 150,000, 150,000 as opposed to 3,000 unaccompanied children, these are children without their parents and without their families, have arrived as applying refugees from our southern border. And so um, in terms of scale and fear factor and hype around Syrians, um, I just wanted to put that a little bit in perspective. Um, <clears throat> also, what this executive order does is it stops the admission of all refugees, so not just those seven countries, but all refugees from entering the United States for four months. Now, this is what you're hearing about in the news, because what you're hearing about is that people who were literally in the air, who were about to land because they had already been processed as refugees, which by the way, is an incredibly long process. Um, the security measures that are taken are very stringent. We are the most stringent refugee accepting country in the world. Our standards and security standards are incredibly high and it takes very long. So these are individuals who had already been vetted through that process. Most of them, in fact, were individuals who were helping the U.S. Army and assisting in our security um, mid-air when this executive order went into effect. Then when they landed, were not allowed to stay in the country. Some were immediately put back on the plane. Others were held in detention. Lawyers are flocking to the airports including Tahereh Justice Center lawyers um, who are there now. And <clears throat> that's what you're hearing about in the press, but it's only that one provision really that you're hearing most about in the press. Okay, the other thing that this order does, and this is what um, Google and Netflix and so many others are responding to, um, is that it uh, suspends the visa waiver program. The visa waiver program is a program that allows 38 countries that are considered allies. This is the United Kingdom, France, um, Canada, like easy, easy countries from entering the United States without having to apply for a visa and go through a face-to-face -face interview. A long process that makes it really hard to take a weekend vacation or do a quick business trip. And this uh, executive order suspends that program. This is not being talked about as much, but I think this is really the provision that's going to have the most economic impact on the United States. And it is what many of these companies are reacting to with outrage is the visa waiver program suspension. Um, and so, and then um, 
In addition to barring and banning refugees from these various countries that we've already talked about, um, it reduces the number of refugees overall to 50,000. Um, that's really small. The United States currently is one of the smallest refugee recipient countries. Um, you know, think about it, 50,000 is like not even the size of a medium-sized college. It's not a lot of people. It's not hard for us to absorb and frankly to benefit from as a country. And 25,000 in this fiscal year, because it's a, it's a fiscal year delegation, not a calendar year de delegation, have already been admitted to the United States. So what that means is that really only 25,000 more could potentially come, and that's an incredibly small number. Some of you may have seen today that um, the Canadian Prime Minister has just pledged to accept those people the United States won't. Um, there is a very small provision in this executive order that allows for the possibility that um, there may be an option to exempt uh, religious minorities from those countries. But the language is incredibly vague um, and nobody knows how that will be implemented. Also, today the White House issued a statement um, in, clarifying how this order would be implemented. Um, this executive order is has a lot of language that from a legal perspective can be seen as very um, ambiguous and kind of gray. And um, many of us who were reading it wondered how it would be implemented. But what we've learned is that Border Patrol agents are being given discretion on how and when to implement it. Now, the culture of Border Patrol and um, their pressure is, of course, to uh, deny people entrance. I mean, no Border Patrol person wants to be the individual that let a terrorist in. And so there's a lot of fear among them to be kind of overkill in their stringency, not underkill. And um, what we're experiencing is that they are applying it to a greater extent than I believe it requires under the law when, when I read this executive order. Um, so the implementation is even more scary than what's happening. Um, let's see. Okay. So that is executive order number one. I'm going to move now to executive order number two. This is called um, Border Security and Immigration Enforcement Improvements. Um, and this was passed on January 25th. So the Border Security and um, uh, Immigration Enforcement Improvements Executive Order. This is the wall. So this is the executive order that really had to do with the wall that people are hearing so much about. And um, frankly, out of all of this, I'm the least worried about the wall um, because the wall requires an act of Congress. There's some things that the president can do without congressional approval or involvement. And then there are other things that he can't do. Uh, sorry, there are things he can do and there are things he can't do. Some of the other things I've just described, he can totally do on his own. And there's very little checks and balances other than the judiciary and the litigation that many of us are engaged in right now. Um, this wall, though, does require congressional action. It requires an act of appropriations from Congress. And so there will be, I think, a long fight about that. Um, some of you may know that the estimate is that it will cost $25 billion to build a wall. Um, just to put that in perspective, that is the amount that is equal to 20 times the amount that the Hoover Dam cost. And it's the entire NASA budget. And so it's an astronomical amount of money. And even um, the proposals that would have so-called Mexico paying for it through some kinds of taxes always flow back to U.S. citizens ultimately paying for it. So um, the import tax, for example, would be placed on goods that we would end up being paid for. You know, but that will all be debated. That will all be debated in Congress, and it's the thing I'm least worried about. Um, but, but actually, there is one thing, thing I want to say about the wall. Um, in addition to it being really expensive that I've already mentioned, it will be ineffectual. Um, and so at a practical level, 
um, even if it was affordable, it will be ineffectual. Um, up to an estimated 44% of all people who are currently in the country um, and do not have documentation came here legally. They came with visas and they just overstayed. And they flew here, they flew here legally and simply stayed. And so this wall, it, even assuming it was affordable, even assuming it was remotely a good idea, will actually be ineffectual to what I think people are most angry about. Um, it's also worth noting that every time a civilization has tried to build a wall, it has begun its downfall. You can look at Rome, you can look at China, um, the Soviet Union, uh, walls never work. Um, okay, and so the other thing that the border immigration enforcement provision does um, that it, to me is really the most disturbing is that it requires the um, detention, the continued uh, incarceration of all those who are applying for asylum who have come to our country uh, or other forms of relief where they are detained. Um, currently, we're already detaining a huge number of people. We detain over 400,000 immigrants. These include children and mothers and others. Um, they are in jail-like facilities. Um, for those of us who have represented those in detention, um, it's often, by the way, immigrants are placed in what's called an immigration detention facility or a maximum security prison facility where the government contracts. And so if they've contracted for immigration inmates in a maximum security prison facility, they are then housed in a prison environment with American convicted felons. Um, our clients will tell us that they prefer the maximum security prison facilities to the immigration detention facilities. They are more humane. Um, they have access to medical care, gender appropriate clothing, an hour of exercise outside a day um, because those facilities house inmates who have a greater degree of due process rights by virtue of the fact that they're U.S. citizens. And so these are horrible conditions that people are held in. Um, somebody that I helped recently from detention, both she and her 12-year-old daughter who had been held there, they fled um, uh, from El Salvador. Um, they came out with pneumonia, which is also often common. There's disease, there's no medical care, and, and they're really horrible places. So uh, currently, annually, 441,000 are already being placed in detention. What this executive order proposes um, would have that number exponentially increase. And um, I actually don't know the exact, I know it's more than five times. So we would be talking about maybe up to 3 million people placed in detention. Already, so the American Corrections Corporation of America, which is the largest contractor that holds the contract for incarceration, this is true for American prisons as well as immigration detention, 44% of their revenue is already coming from immigration detention. This is the American Corrections Corporation of America. And so we have an industrial complex, a private profit motive that's also being fed by the continued detention of immigrants. And with this current executive order, it will only get worse. By the way, it costs $343 per day to detain an immigrant woman and her children. It is expensive. And just to put that in comparison at the Tahereh Justice Center, and this is true, I'm sure, for other legal services organizations, we can protect um, a woman through completely free legal representation and social services assistance for $5,000 a year. And so you can see how, and this is $343 a day, multiply that by 395 days per year. I, I'm not a good mathematician, but you can see how this would be just incredibly expensive to do. So um, it's inhumane, but it's also incredibly expensive to detain people in the way that this executive order proposes to. Okay, moving along it proposes new border patrol agents, but that requires an act of Congress. 
Um, it also requires the allocation of immigration judges and asylum officers to detention facilities. So I think there's a vision that people will all be detained there and then they want immigration judges and asylum officers to cluster there to process cases. Um, this is um, extremely, extremely bad. The reason for that is that there are immigration courts all over the country that are already backlogged. At the Tyree Just Center, we regularly have non-detained asylum cases being scheduled out to 2021, 2022. While their case is waiting to be adjudicated, they may be homeless. They do not sometimes have often have work authorization. Um, their evidence would become stale. Witnesses go away. It's very difficult with that length of time for their first trial on their case in order to find justice for them. Now, already backlogged, already overwhelmed and overworked, if then immigration judges are taken away from current courts and all placed into detention, that will increase the backlog further. And the advocacy community experienced this in a, um, in a small way um, during the surge of children arriving at the border, um, the Obama administration then created what was called affectionately the rocket docket, where it tried to process children in and out of detention at the border within two weeks. And as a result, they allocated really just a handful of judges to detention facilities. And even that move significantly increased delays and backlogs. So what is being proposed in these executive orders would have an even more devastating effect on the whole immigration system. Another fun fact is that in a separate executive order, um, he froze all federal civilian staff hiring, froze it. And so there are a few things that are insane about that. One is that whenever there's a change in administration, um, staff leave. Um, they they you know they leave for non political reasons. Sometimes they do leave for political reasons. But many people are understandably going to be resigning who are civilian attorneys at the Justice Department and other people as a new administration comes in. He has now, through that executive order, placed a freeze on all federal hiring. And so it's going to create this void of staff being able to process these cases and do this work. Um, which is, is, is just going to create an incredibly, incredibly difficult situation. Okay, so, um, all right, so I'm going to move on from that second executive order. The main features which are really, really concerning is, is the allocation of immigration judges um, to uh, detention facilities, the detention of people at historic astronomical levels, which, by the way, and most importantly, um, are in violation of law um, in 1997. There was a law passed that made it clear that it was um, unlawful to detain children. The United States figured out a long time ago um, that it was inhumane to jail children, um, even children born to parents in prison are not allowed to be raised there. Um, but uh, and this was you know, before this administration, it was in the last administration, we began as a country to detain mothers and children. And these are mothers and children who are fleeing violence. The levels of of murder, the daily violent death rates in Central American countries, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, exceed the daily violent death rates of Syria. And so these are war-torn countries and those arriving at our southern border from them, again, mostly women and children, are refugees. And to place them in detention is in violation of the law. Um, that those cases um, which began prior to this administration are still pending. Um, advocates have won those cases all through federal court, including um, federal circuit court, and now it's primed to go to the Supreme Court. Um, so this law would, or this executive order would just increase those detentions. So again, the wall, which is getting most attention, I'm the least concerned about. Okay, so the last order is called um, Enhancing Public Safety. Uh, in the interior of the United States, um, that uh, executive order was passed on January 25th, and that's the order that people most often discuss in the context um, uh, of, well, something called sanctuary cities, which, which, by the way, I don't even know what that means. I'm going to tell you what actually people are talking about. This concept of sanctuary cities and that phrase is a misnomer. What this is about is a basic provision in the U.S. Constitution that says the federal government basically can't force 
local governments to do its dirty work. And so if there is a federal law and federal um, um, implementation or enforcement of that law, uh, it can't require local governments to carry it out. This is a, um, a constitutional provision that has existed for a long time. And so, um, again, in the last administration, um, there was an effort, and frankly, the administration before that, there was an effort to enlist local police to double as immigration agents. Um, and they wanted them to round people up and report them back to ICE, um, Immigration Customs Enforcement Unit, and collaborate with them in deportations. Many local cities, uh, the, the federal, the association, the National Association of Chiefs of Police, very rightfully reacted and said, um, that would inhibit our ability to do our job because we need witnesses of crime to come forward without being fearful of deportation. We need victims of crime to come forward without fearful being fearful of de deportation. Um, you know, if there is gang violence in our city, we want witnesses who saw those gangs coming forward and reporting them. And it makes us all unsafe to have a whole segment of our society refusing to come forward and collaborate with police because they fear deportation. Um, particularly, you can imagine the Tahrir Justice Center works with domestic violence victims, human trafficking victims, um, and many others. And if a woman is being beaten up in her home, she should dial 911. She should be able to, every single person in this country should have the right to dial 911 and access police protection. But if you add on the role of the police deportation, then those from the immigrant community are not going to be calling 911. And it's not just those who are undocumented. It's those who are documented, who may have family members that they wouldn't want. They wouldn't want a police officer to come to their home, that kind of thing. So it's incredibly damaging. Law enforcement understands that. And many local police and uh, city localities are stepping forward and saying, this does not help us. This actually hurts us. And so, you know, I think it, it's, it's important that we understand what this really fundamentally is. It's, a, the, it's, it's an implementation. This executive order is trying to force local police to hand over immigrants who um, may be deportable, um, even though it may hamper local police law enforcement efforts and in turn make those communities unsafe. Um, there, there's uh, section five of that particular executive order. Um, if you can get a hold of it, and it's it's publicly available on the White House website. You can go to whitehouse.com and read all of these executive orders. The executive order entitled "Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States." Go to section five, and I think you'll be shocked by the number of people it includes. Um, it uh, asks for the rounded up deportation. This is moving away from the sanctuary cities concept, by the way. So what this executive order asks is for the heightened uh, ramped up deportation. And, and we saw this under the Obama administration where there were raids. Um, police would arrive, or ICE officers would arrive at six in the morning, knock on a family's door, would take people um, in their pajamas, would take um, children who had been born here were U.S. citizens out of the arms of their mothers, and then would place them in deportation proceedings. That is going to ramp up and get worse under this executive order. But what is very scary is that this executive order is extremely broad. It not only includes people who are convicted of a crime, or who have been found to be deportable. And what I mean by that is that if you're in the United States, let's say you came on a student visa and um, you knew that you could not return to your country because your religion was being persecuted, your family was just executed, um, an aunt who escaped to Sweden uh, emailed you and said, you cannot come home. I know you went to the United States on a student visa, but you cannot come home, you are in danger. You then have the right to apply for asylum, but while you're applying for asylum, your student visa might run out. And then there might be a period of time where you appear to be undocumented. Um, similarly, a woman might be married to a US citizen 
she marries, you know, somebody who I knew, um, met somebody who was at Yale, was studying architecture, went to France, met a French woman, fell in love, brought her to the United States and married her, but he turned out to be abusive. He was a U.S. citizen. As a further tool of abuse, he refused to petition for her legal status. She should be legal. As a wife of a U.S. citizen, she should have a green card and within a very short period of time be a U.S. citizen. Um, but as a tool of abuse, he kept her undocumented. This is who we're talking about. And so if you fall into that category, like I said, up to 44% of all people who are considered undocumented in the United States came here legally. Everyone has a different story. But what this order would do is it would deport all of those people. And I'm going to read it. It says, have been convicted of any criminal offense. I think that's the only thing people are hearing about. Also, have been charged with any criminal offense. So, and it says, where such charge has not been resolved, it's like explicit in this executive order that it wants people to be deportable even where they've been charged. This is horrible for domestic violence victims because it is very common with the women we work for that there is a charge of violence against them. Um, a woman who is being strangled may bite her husband's hand as he's trying to kill her. And so what happens is when the police come to the home, um, he's charged with a crime, but then he says, yeah, but she bit me. Look, I've got the bite marks. And it's not until they go to trial where she can explain that that was self-defense. So there may be a charge on her record. This executive order would have her be deportable. Um, it also says, um, it says a lot, um, I'm going to focus on just a few of them, um, have uh, in judgment of an immigration officer pose a risk to public safety or national security. So that's an ideological test, again, that goes way beyond whether somebody has, in fact, been charged, uh, been convicted of a criminal um, offense. Um, also, if they have been subject to a final order of removal, it says nothing about respecting their legal right to appeal that removal. This makes it appear as though they would be deportable even during the pendency of that appeal. Um, then the real kicker <laughs> is subsection C, having committed acts that constitute a chargeable criminal offense. I don't, I don't even know what that means. So this executive order is not only saying that we're going to round up people who are convicted criminals. It says we're going to round up people who've been charged with any criminal offense, and we're going to round up people who have committed an act that could constitute a chargeable criminal offense. And so I don't know how one adjudicates that. You know, if somebody says, well, you know, she hit me. Oh, okay. Well, that could constitute a chargeable criminal offense without any judicial process. This requires no finding of having done anything wrong, just the suspicion of the potential of the possibility of having done something wrong. Um, and that's an incredibly scary environment for us to be in. Um, so there's more here. Um, I really encourage people to look at more detail at all of these executive orders. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, all of this will be litigated. Lawyers currently are mobilizing um, in order to um, uh, fight legally. I think there's really great uh, legal arguments against these things, as I've already highlighted. Um, and so this, you know, this will be the battleground. We'll be in the law and in the courts in order to try to undo these executive orders, um, not only to protect refugees, but to protect our cities, their safety, to protect our humanity, to protect our economy, which is going to be hugely impacted. There's far reaching implications that are way beyond the wall or refugees that were in process, um, and certainly well beyond criminal um, immigrants who were in the United States. I, I hope I've, tr I've tried, um, and it, I know it's very complicated, but I've tried to explain a lot of that. I hope it was somewhat understandable. Um, so what do you do about it? Um, you can do a lot about it. Um, and I, I know people don't like hearing this, but we need funding. Um, we need to hire more lawyers. We need people on the ground. We, as I mentioned, have people at the airport right now. We don't have enough people. Um, absolutely donate if you can. 
Um, donate to the Tahereh Just Center, obviously, but there are many organizations. You can pick anybody who you love. Um, call your representatives and Congress people. Tell them how angry you are, even if you are in a blue state. And what I mean by that is, obviously, if you have a Republican um, congressional representative, they might have more influence with the president, um, but even not, still express your displeasure. Um, and one really great example, just yesterday, Cory Booker um, from New Jersey, who, who obviously is in DC because of his congressional position, physically came to Dulles International Airport and physically helped the attorneys there gain access to secure locations in the airport. So representatives can be helpful even helping the attorneys gain access to these secure areas of the airport um, because Border Patrol has been given a huge amount of discretion on who it wants to let in, who it's not going to let in, and they're not letting lawyers in. I know um, I checked in with Archie, our director of policy and programs, who's at Dulles as we speak, and they're not letting them in right now. And so um, that kind of pressure is really important. Definitely go to the, op um, the airports and protest. It helps because media like visuals. They like something that they can... Um, kind of put on air to show that people care. And so um, please go make your signs, bring your kids and show your displeasure with these things. Um, it might seem a little empty, but it matters because it helps draw attention and it helps let people know. Um, you can try calling the White House. Now, this is a really um, interesting thing. There used to be something called the White House comment line and you could call it and let your opinions be known. Tahari's staff all day Friday were trying to call the comment line and it kept saying that it was closed. We don't know if that's a permanent thing or if it's a temporary thing. Um, and then the White House comment line had um, a recording that said we are closed, uh, but we care about your opinion and so send us a private Facebook message. Um, but then we tried that and it seems actually impossible through Facebook Messenger to Facebook the White House. Um, so we're really struggling, frankly, with how to get through to the White House, but everyone should continue to try. We're going to post on the Tahereh Justice Center's website right after this the really specific phone numbers that you can use. Um, find your congressperson, call them, uh, call the White House. Um, go protest and donate. Those are the really the biggest things that you can do. Unfortunately, the practical or, or tactical work that has to be done with these executive orders requires lawyers. It's litigation. It's all about bringing lawsuits and litigating. And um, I know the ACLU is getting a lot of attention and it's doing amazing work. Um, they also have a really great communications and well-sourced team. Um, but there are litigation teams and lawyers all over the country. Everyone is doing great work. You see it, ACLU is doing great work, but there are also a lot of other organizations that are on the front lines who are bringing lawsuits on behalf of the women and girls and um, also men that they're serving through um, the immigration process. So please, please engage. Thank you so much for all of your help. I hope I've been able to answer some of your questions. Um, and we will post this online. And then as new executive <laughs> orders come out, um, I'll do my best to try to maybe come back and help explain what's going on. Um, there's a lot of emotion to this, but there's a lot of really tactical, specific stuff um, that's going to be a long, a long haul. So have a great Sunday. Thank you.